one comment about mathematics is that it allows you to be so precise that you can possibly find out the limits of your understanding. Okay, you can precisely find where you're wrong. And I'm uh, hoping that in today's talk, um, at least some of you might be able to show me that, uh, where I'm wrong. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. I, so this is called Conscious Agent Model in the Physical World. It's really describing a program based on a particular approach to consciousness studies, um, <clears throat> which I will describe in a moment. Uh, it's an exploration of what I'm calling the body-mind problem somewhat provocatively. Um, the problem is, is this, that we assume that there exist conscious, conscious experiences, sorry, and we assume that there exist probabilistic relationships between experiences, and we ex assume nothing else. Um, so then the question arises, oops, how does the material world arise in consciousness? Okay, so that's the kind of reverse mind-body problem. So in particular, how do the facts of physics arise in consciousness? What is the role of space-time within consciousness? <clears throat> so space-time, according to physicists, is doomed. <laughs> okay? It's not considered any longer to be a fundamental theory of physics, a fundamental aspect of physics. Um, it, it has no operational meaning below the Planck, Planck length, for example, in, in quantum theory. And um, when you study this, you can realize that, that as you try to increase your measurement accuracy um, beyond certain limits, black holes form and destroy your, your, your laboratory, <laughs> okay, beyond a certain limit. So just a few quotes from famous physicists and mathematicians about their attitude towards the fact that space-time is not fundamental, okay? There's something else going on, there's something deeper, and in fact, a number of physicists have recently done some tremendous work of going beyond space-time, and <clears throat> they've, they've come up with some um, entities called the amplitudehedron and, and further uh, other polytopes, which are related to uh, the positive Grassmannian, an, an ancient mathematical idea. Um, and the, the amplitudehedron is a polytope. It's the static structure in some abstract space. Um, and its facets, the, the faces of these, this polytope, are characterized by decorated permutations. And in some cases, those faces and the decorated permutations give rise to, uh, well, decorated permutations are related to what are called on-shell graphs in physics. And <laughs> the scattering amplitudes that have been experimentally discovered with certain scattering of elementary particles are described exactly by this structure and by the decorated, so-called decorated permutations on these facets. The, uh, these permutations, which I will talk about a little bit more uh, later, they <clears throat> describe a measure on the facets which gives you invariant information about scattering phenomena. Now, scattering phenomena are the most basic um, form of interaction in uh, experimental physics with what we consider to be the foundational elements of the physical world. So um, that's why I'm, I, I decided to talk about those today. Okay, so what is beyond space-time? I mean, the amplitudehedron is beyond space-time. It's not, it, it, it's, things are happening in space-time as a result of what's going on in the faces of the amplitudehedron. Um, but the problem with it is that it's a static extension of, of physics. It's, there's no dynamical understanding of what's actually going on, what gives rise to this amplitudehedron. Okay. And so, fairly quickly today, I'm going to propose a stochastic dynamical basis. All right. So, <clears throat> the point of view that we're taking is the point of view of what's called the conscious realism hypothesis, somewhat provocative. This should, really should be called idealism, I'm told, from yesterday's talk. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that it's consciousness that is fundamental, okay? Conscious experiences and their relationships are fundamental. And I'm going to take that as a working hypothesis, whether you believe it or not. Okay, 
I mean, it's equally good as the other hypothesis, which is that uh, the material world gives rise to consciousness. I, neither of them have been proven yet, so let's explore this. Okay. <clears throat> so, basic conscious experiences that we can all agree on are, are perception, uh, making choices or decisions, decision making, and uh, action. Okay. So, uh, using that, we, we are defining a model of what, are, what we call conscious agents as the building blocks with which we're going to develop the theory of conscious realism. Um, so, what is a conscious agent? A conscious agent is something that is an entity that exists in a world, experiences a world, and the way it ex experiences it is it perceives the world. Having had an experience, it makes a decision on taking an action in the world, and then it performs that action. Okay, so we're, we're trying to look at the most parsimonious possible definition of what a building block of uh, this theory could be. So the basic building block is this. It doesn't have a self. It, of course, it, it has some kind of identity, I suppose, but it doesn't, the notion of self uh, is not part of the definition. It, there's no memory, there's no size or place. This is not in space-time in the first place. Okay, it's just an idea of what conscious uh, experiencing and acting is about. Okay. So, mathematizing it, as we are being requested to do uh, the entire last hour, um, we want to, again, have the most parsimonious uh, <clears throat> definition of, of a conscious agent. So, it consists of these seven things. Okay. Um, it, it consists of a set of world states, uh, a set of experiences, a set of actions, which are provocatively called G because it could be a group, and some people uh, like that very much. And then there are these arrows which describe uh, how you go from one of these sets to the other. So these are sets of states, okay? And the arrows themselves, I'm still trying to figure out how this works, sorry. Um, we, we take as a, as a minimal uh, <clears throat> definition that, that the... Um, Sorry, the, the, the sets themselves are measurable spaces so that we can talk about probabilities. It's, if you can't talk about probabilities, I don't, I don't know whether we can really do science. So we want, we want to at least be able to talk about those. And as a result, the arrows between them are what we call Markov kernels, which basically take a point of one space and give you a probability measure on the other space. So if there's a, a point in the world that is giving you the, an experience, that experience will be a probability measure on your set of experiences. Or the, the experience will exist as part of a probability measure. Okay, so these are Markov kernels. Um, <clears throat> N is just an integer that counts how many times since the beginning, or whatever the beginning is, that we've had an experience or we've made a decision. You can decide where, what n applies to. Um, <clears throat> so that's the building block. And then the next hypothesis I want to make is the conscious agent hypothesis, which is that the world of an agent is a network of conscious agents, of which the agent itself is one node. But in general, they, there could be many, many conscious agents interacting with each other in a network. Um, <clears throat> and the point is that it's consciousness all the way down, all right? It's consciousness interacting with itself in some sense, okay? So that's the, the basic building block and the basic uh, assumption of this theory. Okay, so given that, we want to develop um, stochastic dynamics that shows how the processes of consciousness work. I guess this might be a process theory. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> the, we're going to, uh, because we're only interested in, in our experiences uh, and how, what the dynamics is on, on those experiences, we're going to look at a particular Markov kernel, which is simply the product of D, A, and P. Okay? You have an experience. You then make a decision based on that experience. That gives you a probability measure on G. Uh, you then act 
which gives you a probability measure on W, and then you have a new experience that gives you a probability measure on P. Okay, so it's going from left to right. And uh, the rest of the talk is really going to be about the uh, dynamics of this Q kernel, which we call the qualia kernel, because X is the space of qualia. Okay. So just to give you an example, the simplest example would be a qualia kernel of, of which has just one bit. All it sees is either it sees red or it doesn't, or either it sees green or it doesn't. And the next level up is a more interesting kernel, which sees either red or green. And in general, a Markov kernel is going to have this form. Okay, so X in this place is a, uh, uh, the probability of seeing green having seen red before. And Y is the probability of having, had, uh, having seen green then seeing red. Okay? And um, if you look at the collection of all such possible kernels, that's simply a product of the unit simplex in one dimension, okay? Um, and it can be depicted in, oh, wait a minute. I think I have a, a slide slightly opposite where it should be. This is the slide where it should have been first. This is M2, simply the, the collection of all two qualia kernels. Um, <clears throat> it's in the unit square. But you can see that there's a certain dynamics taking place over here with the arrows. And by that, I mean the, if, if you run the Markov process with Q uh, on the state space X, then that process is going to tend towards something, except in one case, where, which in this particular corner of it, which is just periodic, all of the, others, all of the other processes are going to tend towards what we call the fusion simplex, where these two colors fuse together essentially, and give you yellow, all right, something like that. Um, going back, I just, uh, to generalize this, we have the m quale space, which is, uh, in general, you have uh, a state space of size n, and then the, the, the Markov polytope, as we call it, which is the collection of all Markov matrices, um, is, is a product of the standard simplex of, of dimension n minus 1. There are n of them, okay? And <clears throat> so the dynamics of Q are such that, as I just mentioned, where for non-periodic Q, Q to the n will converge as n goes to infinity to a matrix whose rows are all its stationary distribution. So it, it converges to a rank one matrix which has a stationary distribution, okay? For those who are not that familiar with this kind of mathematics, I'll just say it converges to something. Okay, and it, what it converges to is something that doesn't change anymore. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, as you go from two to three, and you're going from four vertices as we saw before, to 27. So you can, you can see what kind of combinatorial explosion we're going to have as n increases. And we're going to be needing ends which are very large, actually. Um, the dynamics becomes very rich. There's, this is just, just to give you a hint of the idea of, of the dynamics. There are various different processes going on inside here. There's the fusion simplex in the center, but there are other things that are happening. There's an extremely rich dynamics. There's another picture of, of the dynamics, which I won't belabor. But it's, it's just a piece of something that gets richer and richer and richer. As, as n increases, it becomes incredibly rich, <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> what we're, our idea was in this, in this whole work was to try to make a connection between this dynamics and what is being observed in certain uh, particle physics experiments. And the reason we want to go to particle physics is that it's much easier to deal with particles than it is to deal with neurons, okay? The, the whole point of this theory is that if it has anything to do with reality, it needs to be able to express how the physical world arises in some way or the other. So we're going to look at one aspect of it. Okay. And the way we suggest this, this process takes place is that this extremely rich Q dynamics that I mentioned is <clears throat> observed in a somewhat ignorant fashion as an aspect of it 
which could turn out to be the physical. Okay, so the, we, we call that a projection. We, we're projecting down in complexity towards a simpler kind of situation. Um, so if you start with the Markovian Q-dynamics of, of one agent on a very large state space, um, <clears throat> an observer we define as an agent, another agent, which is really ignorant of the whole state space because that's too much, um, but it's observing the dynamics through certain windows. And we're going to be very precise about what these windows are. Um, so the first idea is to trace the dynamics in what I'm calling a spatial window. And I'm putting spatial in, in quotes because there is no space and time here. By spatial, I just mean a smaller set, a subset. Okay, we, we're starting with the subset of the state space, uh, which is the experiential space X. And what we're doing is we're projecting this dynamics down to onto a dynamics on a smaller window, a spatial window. And the other thing that you can do with this, with the, when you're trying to observe the dynamics with your limited observational capabilities, by your I mean the observer, um, is that you can look at the dynamics in clumps. You can sample the dynamics, in other words, statistically sample the dynamics. So the other kind of uh, projection is to sample the trace dynamics in a temporal window. And again, temporal here just means as n clicks on, you're looking at certain bunches of n's. And you're, you're then in reinterpreting what sort of a Markov process is taking place now. Okay. Now, it's well understood in Markov chain theory that, <clears throat> that uh, if you take a chain on some state space with a Markov kernel, which, which is driving the, the process, and which has an initial probability measure mu, if you trace it on a subset, in this case the subset is A, then you again get a Markovian dynamics. The, the Markovian nature doesn't disappear. Okay, so you still have a Markovian dynamics, but now we have a Markovian dynamics on a simpler state space. So it's, it's been projected down. And uh, uh, th this is done by observing the chain only when it enters into that subset. That's a random time that it enters the subset, but you can fairly easily uh, derive the fact that it is, an, again, a Markov chain just on A, uh, and this is its kernel in terms of the original kernel. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the definition of a trace chain. Uh, that's the spatial restriction or the spatial projection. Um, and similarly, you can also do sampling on top of that, which in, in some sense, it decreases um, your knowledge of the original chain even further. Okay, so the idea here is then we're going to be tracing on a communicating class, which is a maximal set of states that communicate with each other. So you, the chain can go between any pair of those uh, elements with positive probability. There are two types of um, such communicating classes. I'm going to use that symbol to describe the class of any particular state, AI. Um, you can have recurrent communicating classes, which communicate them with, only with themselves. You, you never leave that particular set. Uh, or, uh, and if you're outside of it and you come in, you don't leave. And then you have transient communicating classes, which uh, you eventually filter out of. Those are the two types of classes that you can have in a, in a uh, Markov process. And even this is true of uh, infinite state spaces, but I'm only considering finite state spaces over here, just for simplicity. Um, <clears throat> so for the qualia kernel Q, its communicating classes, it turns out, are characterized by the same decorated permutations that characterize physical scattering processes. By same, I just mean the same definition, or the same kind of entity. I don't mean that they're equal. That's something we have to find. Um, so now I have to tell you what a decorated permutation is. It's basically a permutation on which, in which you put a little color on some of the entries. <laughs> that's, that's all you do. And one way to describe it is to say that if the original state space has, has got n elements, a decorated permutation is one in which you can, you can put an extra decoration on some of these guys. Okay? You can either call it AI, 
or the colored version I'm going to call ai plus n. So decorated permutation is a function that takes this n element set into a 2n element set. Yeah? Five minutes already? Oh, good lord. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. When I practiced this, I was done with this in about three minutes. Anyway, sorry. Okay, so let me uh, sort of go quickly through this. I, you don't have to see the details of what the decorated permutation is. You can always check at the, you know, by reading the papers. But th there is a way of describing these decorated permutations. It also generates to any finite graph, uh, generalizes, sorry. Um, these are new ideas and uh, uh, new applications of decorated permutations in mathematics, but of course they were they're quite well known in physics. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now having, project, having discovered that decorated permutations describe your traced and sampled chains, you can recognize that certain properties of communicating classes can project to properties of dec decorated permutations. Okay, and the fact is, as I said right at the beginning, these decorated permutations may characterize physical scattering processes. So a particle in space-time is an aspect of a physical projection. That's, that's our proposal. Uh, and it's an aspect of the dynamics of a communicating class of conscious agents to a particular face of an amplitudehedron. So uh, you can describe scattering processes by means of this qualia dynamics. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's a motivation for that, and I'm going to tell you about what we know from experimental physics. So the configuration of quarks and gluons observed inside a proton is really an artifact of how you look at it. Okay, so shutter speed, for example, is something that when it's very fast, all you see is a gluon ocean. You just see an ocean of massless particles in a proton that has mass. Okay, so this is something very interesting. At medium speeds, the six kinds of new quarks appear. And at slow speeds, when you're looking at it, you're taking your time to look at it, the proton looks more like what, in popular imagination, a proton it looks like. Namely, it's got three valency quarks and there are gluons going between them. But this is an artifact, and that's my main point here. Okay, another aspect of this is when, when, you, when you do the spatial resolution, when you look at the gluon in, at, at, uh, uh, at different spatial resolutions. There's something wrong with this slide over here. But again, let me just point out that things change in a very dramatic way as your resolution changes. And so really the structure that you're seeing seems to be an artifact of the way you're looking at it. Okay, so that's the main point over here. The, the whole idea, I just, summarize what we're, what we're going to do, and then I'll have a few quick slides and finish off, um, <clears throat> is that the asymptotics of a, a qualia stochastic process lead to decorated permutations, which then lead to the stuff that physicists have done to describe scattering processes. So we're doing really the easy part over here, Physicists have already done the heavy work. And what we're trying to do is to try to, ma to match up with what they have done. Okay. Uh, we're not sure that this is going to work, but we think that there's a good chance if you take a big enough initial state space. And we're thinking 557 by 557 would be a good start. So again, we've got this combinatorial problem that, that seems to arise in consciousness studies everywhere. <laughs> okay. Um, the idea is this, start with a large Markovian matrix with a single communicating class, compute sample trace chains with various different spatial and temporal windows just to get a big set of possibilities, and then <clears throat> in each sample trace chain find its communicating classes. And if the communicating classes are such that, uh, that they, the, the, the traced, uh, which button, yeah this one, the traced kernel Q looks like this, then these two classes are not talking to each other. We'll think of these as being free particles. They're representing free particles. Okay. Another thing that could happen is that you have very small off-diagonal matrices, and we think of that as bound particles with small interactions. 
I know this is completely wild, but it's a try. It's a, it's it's an honest attempt. Um, if you have apartheid set where your your uh, state space um, when uh, in the Markov process becomes a graph, in the Markov process is graphs, and and uh, and there you have um, communicating classes which are which are not communicating inside themselves, but only with each other, then this looks like some, what we call confined particles, okay? And then the idea is that you can make, we, we've made various suggestions of what could correspond to physical properties in this situation. So what could cost possibly correspond to mass? Uh, we're suggesting that it could be entropy rate of the Q kernel. And the reason is that a, a Q kernel which has zero entropy has only zeros and ones in each row, uh, which means that there's a minimal self-interaction in that particular communicating class. Okay, we think of that as zero mass. And as the entropy increases, the interactions between uh, uh, the points in the state space will also increase. And so this is a suggestion that this may correspond to the mass of the particles that we're, um, uh, we're trying to make connections with. Okay, this is just a repeat of the same slide. I'll, I'll skip that. Um, we have a notion of what energy could be. We have a notion of possibly what even spin could be, but I'm not going to mention that just now. I'm just almost done. The computational experiment that we're proposing then is to take properties of the transition matrix of a sample trace matrix corresponding to a general situation and to find one which is such that it corresponds to physical properties. Um, and that's the question. Can this give scattering amplitudes in space-time? We think there's a very good chance, actually, because of the combinatorial situation. And the idea is to compare this with the experiment. That's what we're proposing. Okay, that's it for now. Thank you.